Many years ago, I was best man at a friend's wedding and sitting there nervously waiting to do my speech. And quite surprisingly, the father of the bride made a brilliant, original and hilarious speech. And one of my friends turned to me and said, follow that. And that's what I'm going to do after Kelly and after everybody else, <laughs> is see if I can provide... I think I might have been invited here to be some sort of light relief, but I don't know whether I can do that. It was, it's a pity you couldn't have invited one of... Uh, I have a friend here, St. John, who was at the Contemporary Isle of Oxford, and one of our contemporaries at Teddy Hall was the uh, brilliant Terry Jones of Monty Python fame, who is an honorary fellow of this college and probably would have provided a far more hilarious and original cabaret for you afterwards. But sadly, Terry has now been diagnosed with dementia and will not be making any more public appearances. So this is for Terry. Just before I start, I want to say a little bit about having been invited as an actor to talk about it from an actor's point of view. And I balked a little, a little. I thought, is there any other point of view? <laughs> I mean, we're not there to be footnotes at the bottom of some academic's garden. So you can imagine my consternation when a few years ago I was in a production at the tobacco factory of Love's Labour's Lost, which incidentally, Kelly, I think Shakespeare made that plot up. There's not much of a plot. It's mainly situation, but that's the only one. Anyway, we were pretty proud of this production. We reckon we got it off the page, onto the stage. So imagine my consternation when sitting in the front row was a man with the text open in his hand. Now, the tobacco factory is not a conventional theatre. It's in the round or in the rectangle. So it's not as if he was sitting halfway back up the stalls. He was in the front row, beautifully lit. Not only could we see him, but every member of the audience could see him. He did occasionally look at the stage, but most of the time he was looking at the text, clearly noting when we got it wrong or when we made cuts. And I became quite obsessed by this. I thought, we've got to get this guy. And at the interval, one of my colleagues, Tom Sherman, who was playing Costard, which if you know the play is a rustic clown character, he said, I can get him. So, as you may know, at the end of Love's Labour's Lost, the, uh, the peasants, the hoi polloi, do a performance for the nobility and the aristocracy, rather like the Pyramus and Thisbe bit in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And in this case, it's about the nine worthies, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and so on. And Tom comes on as this peasant character and says, I, Pompey, am the rival of Caesar. This being the sort of play where the audience are mainly um, aristocratic, arrogant people who like to interrupt whenever an ordinary person speaks. He keeps getting interrupted. No, you're not. Where's your coat of arms? He tries again. I, Pompey, am. Again, there's an interruption. Then he gets the line out. I, Pompey, am surnamed the big. And Dumaine says, the great. And the line is, it is great, sir. I, Pompey, am surnamed the great. On this occasion, the guy calls out. He says, I, Pompey, am surnamed the big. And the Lord calls out, the great. And Tom looked at him, and looked at the others, then looked at the audience, then walked to the front row, took the script out of the man's hand, looked at it and said, it is great, sir. I, Pompey, am surnamed the great. Shut the book, gave it back to him. <laughs> to say it stopped the show would be perhaps an exaggeration, but I don't think I've ever experienced such a moment of spontaneous glee in the theatre as happened on that occasion. The entire audience, all the cast, without stopping the show, went up, as we say. Um, so, I... But the man's companion, his wife or partner sitting, sitting beside him, was rocking forward in her seat, puce with a mixture of embarrassment and delight. He, to his credit, put the book under his seat and watched the rest of the play. I picked three speeches. I did pick these myself, but I thought I'd do a bit of research. And I looked at Mary Cowden Clark's monumental concordance. This is before computers. In the middle of the 19th century, she produced an index to Shakespeare which has 300,000 entries, mainly mind, thought, and see. Uh, but under the word brain or brains, there are 118 entries. 
look them up if you'd like to. But I'm going to read you, and this is not, incidentally, for those of you who are directors here, it's not an audition. I'm just going to read <laughs> it. You will find how many, well, if you, well, if you like, yes. Um, <laughs> you will be surprised how many echoes there are in these three speeches of what we've been talked about. The first one is the last, not the last scene, Act 5 of King Richard II. Richard has been deposed by Bolingbroke, who, or Bolingbroke, who's become king as Henry IV, and Richard is in prison in Pomfret Castle. And I don't think I need to make any comment. I'll make one comment at the end. But he says, I have been studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for, for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain I'll prove the female to my soul. My soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. And these same thoughts people this little world in humours like the people of this world. For no thought is contented. The better sort as thoughts of things divide, are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word. As thus, come little ones, and then again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders, how these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves, nor shall not be the last. Like silly beggars who sitting in the socks, <laughs> who sitting in the stocks, refuge their shame that many have and others must sit there. And in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person many people and none contented. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke, and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I, nor any man that but man is, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Right. Now, I'm taking something on here after what Kelly Hunter just did. I want to look at, and actually look at as well as read, one of the two most famous speeches in Shakespeare, the dagger speech. And the reason I want to look at, picking up what everybody else has said, what you in particular have said about the, um, what the characters say, you mentioned the name. As someone who tries to do Shakespeare, I'm somewhere halfway through the spectrum on what you do with Shakespeare. I'm not all that keen on people coming in with concepts, but I do like the idea of examining the text as closely as possible and trying to find an original, innovative way of doing it. Not for all time, for, for us, for our production. And one of the problems with Shakespeare is as soon as you mention it, I mentioned the name. We all know Romeo and Juliet ends in tears, but Juliet doesn't know, so you don't necessarily need to start off doing a sad play with sad acting or a comic play with comic acting. And with Macbeth, people say, horror, supernatural. And then sometimes even very good actors will do horrid acting, in both senses of the word. I think I'll read this as neutrally as I can, and then I'd like to talk about an approach that we might do, if you don't mind, if I may indulge myself. He says to a servant, Go bid thy mistress, when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell, get thee to bed. 
Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshals me the way that I was going and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still, and on thy blade and dungeon gouts of blood which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which involves thus to mine eyes. Now, the one half world, nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings, and withered murder alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm, said Earth, Hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear the very stones prate of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. As I threat, he lives, whereas to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done, the bell invites me, hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Right. Now, I would like to talk about this if we've got the time. Three, a few weeks ago, on the 1st of November, the day after Halloween, I did a workshop with some fellow actors where we looked at the first time Macbeth and Banquo met the witches. Coming at it with the premise that everybody can have fun with witches, witness Halloween, but nobody much really believes in them. You can tell me King James I did, maybe Shakespeare did. So we started with the premise that there were people pretending to be witches. Kids trick-or-treating, a hen party, daft sports fans or whatever. And three mature actresses came up with the idea that they were middle-aged, randy women who liked to make up poems and meet in the woods and put on costumes and frighten the life out of the village children. And they were wanted to be groupies for the superstars Macbeth and Banquo. So when Macbeth and Banquo turned up, they came up, hail Thane of Glamis. And then the next one, I've got to beat that. So she gives him a title which he hasn't yet got. Then another one says king. Macbeth and Banquo, in this particular version, didn't believe they were witches, but played along, as you might, with children who knocked on your door. The reason I mentioned that is going from there to a scepticism in Macbeth about the supernatural. So he doesn't actually, in my version, believe in the witches, but he's surprised when they come up with things that are going on in his subconscious. He has, as you remember, already had an argument with Lady Macbeth about whether he's going to do it or not, and she finally persuades him that it would be a good idea to kill the king. He then is waiting for the signal that she's successfully got the bodyguard of Duncan boozed up enough so that they're asleep and he'll, the coast is clear, and he meets Banquo, and they have a very laid-back, desultory conversation. They mention the witnesses, uh, the witnesses, the witches, and it ends up with Macbeth saying, very really, normally, God, good repose the while, and Banquo says, thanks, sir, the like to you. Then he says, go bid thy mistress when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bill. I immediately had this wonderful idea that on a normal night, Macbeth has a cup of cocoa before he goes to bed, or maybe a dram of whiskey. But a normal drink, she strike upon the bell. I have seen productions where, because of what happens at the end of the speech, it is a knell that summons Duncan heaven or to hell, you get a funereal toll. But it's likely to be just a little tinkly bell. Then, I don't want to do the speech again, nor do I want to perform it particularly, but I think that he is interested in what has happened. He's not necessarily horrified. 
by God, is this a, is this a dagger? <coughs> and I'm, by the way, I'm of the camp. I know there are a lot of different soliloquies, but on the whole, I think soliloquies, you use the audience. You don't necessarily buttonhole them, but you use the audience either as, uh, as, as an audience to talk to. Is this a dagger? Is this a dagger I see before me? I mean, I wouldn't mind them trying that, but at least it's to your alter ego. Is, there, is this a dagger I see before? And I would be interested in an actor playing the argument before he worries about the emotion. What is going on? What is happening? What is he trying to find out? You, somebody made the point about the actor is trying, or the character is trying to investigate something, to develop something. So he asks if it's a dagger, the handle to pull me, it's pretty obvious. Ah, but I can't, this is very puzzling. I can't get hold of it. I mean, it can't, is, are you not sensible to feeling as to sight? And then the thing that echoes what we've all been talking about, or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation of the heat-oppressive brain. So he knows that what is going on in his brain is something that is in his subconscious, if I dare use the word, but not necessarily something that is external. It's created perhaps by his subconscious. And he goes on to say, I see thee yet, you're the same as the one I've taken out of my pocket or out of my sheath, and you are encouraging me to go the way that I was going, and I was going to use a dagger like that. In uh, echoing your thing, Kelly, mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. So either my eyes are deceiving me, or they're giving me the message that I really want to hear. I see thee still, and now there's blood on it. And then he says, and this is why I think that being agnostic or sceptical about the supernatural is quite a useful exercise, at the very least, for the actor to follow. He, he says, there's no such thing. It's the bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. It's because I want to kill the bloke that I'm seeing this vision. And now we get to what is probably the most difficult bit, because he goes into a sort of dark poeticizing. Now, oh, the one half world nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings of withered murder, allowing by his sentinel the wolf, whose howls, oh, well, let's stop there. What it seems to me is going on, if he's in a courtyard and it's dark, I want to do this, I want to murder Duncan, I want to become king. It's a dark night, and now the whole moral universe is starting to be out of kilter. It's dark, it's mysterious, and this, the whole world, is encouraging me to go the way that I was going. So it's not that he necessarily believes in witchcraft, but he's aware that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in philosophy. Something's going on which fits with his subconscious desire. And I think... And this is where, if you watch YouTube versions of this speech, they're all intensely done. I think he should be on the move. Now is the world like this. Now I've got to, now I'm going to go and move. He then says, whose howls his watch, that's the wolf. The wolf alerts me. The wolf is a symbol of darkness, witchcraft, and so on. And this is waking me up to do what I've got to do. And he says with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design moves like a ghost. And many of you may know Tarquin, is, and this is where scholarship from the scholars helps us. You can look up. Sextus Tarquinius was the son of Tarquin, Super, the Super, Tarquin the Proud, who ended up being the last king of Rome. And he rapes a woman who is not only the wife of his friend and cousin, but also his hostess. And he... Shakespeare himself, ten or so years earlier, wrote a poem called The Rape of Lucrece. And any fear or scruples that Tarquin had were beaten away by brain-sick, rude desire, he says in The Rape of Lucrece. Again, the brain is sick, rude desire. I think it's interesting, and I will finish pretty soon on this particular speech and then read you one more. I think it's interesting that he uses a simile of sexual violence because it seems not that he 
has a sexual attitude towards killing Duncan, but that he expects it to be as adrenaline rush producing, as exciting and as wonderful as the best orgasm he's ever had in his life. And then he sets out on it and says, I've still got to be careful, this may be the most exciting thing I've ever done. Thou sure and firm said, Earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear the very stones prey to my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time. And again, as many of us know, a good adage for any acting is if you say it, don't show it. So if he talks about horror, he doesn't need to necessarily act horror, which now suits with him. Then he says, whilst I threat he lives, where's to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives? Let me get on with it. A bell rings, I go and it is done. The bell invites me. And the fact that he goes, hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. I think... I'm not sure, I think, could be played lightly. He might even find the bell quite amusing because he was going to kill somebody and then we thought, he, tea's ready, darling. Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Hear it not, Duncan, is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. So all I'm suggesting, that is not the answer. That is not necessarily how it should be played. But as an actor myself and watching other actors, I'd like them, particularly with the classic play, to try and get rid of the accretion of tradition because otherwise you get generalised acting. In my opinion, the most common mistake that even good actors make is to act the result, rather than the journey to get there. OK, that's what I want to say about that. Now, we can't finish without a word from our sponsor. This is the commercial. Right. And again, although I want us to be amused here, it's surprising how much there is about the brain in this speech. It's full staff in Henry the Fourth, Part Two. He has just successfully captured an enemy soldier called Sir John Colville. He's managed to capture him without a fight because he, full staff has acquired a quite unjustified reputation as the killer of Hotspur in part one. He then passes on the prisoner to Prince Hal's brother, John, who's a nasty little shit, if you'll pardon the expression. He makes a few uncomplimentary remarks about Prince John, and then, and this one I'm sure he does to the audience. So he says, a good sheriff's sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain, dries me there, all the foolish and dull and cruddy vapours which environ it, makes it apprehensive, quick, fugitive, full of nimble, fiery and delectable shapes, which delivered o'er to the voice. The tongue, which is the birth, becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent sheriff's is the warming of the blood, which before cold and settled left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. For the sheriff warms it, makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extreme. It illumineth the face, which is a beacon gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom man to arm. And then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits Muster me all to their captain the heart, who grayed and puffed up with this retinue doth any deed of courage, and this valour comes of sheriffs. So that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack, for that sets it work. And learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil till sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Hereof comes it that Prince Harry is valiant. For the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father. He hath like lean, sterile and bare land, manured, husbanded and tilled, with excellent endeavour of drinking good and good store of fertile sherries, that he is become very hot and valiant. If I had a thousand sons, the first human principle I would teach them 
should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack.